Welcome to the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies. We're very pleased to welcome today Professor Susan Hyde, Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs from Yale University. Today she will be speaking on the pseudo-democrats dilemma, why election monitoring became an international norm. Uh, as you may know, uh, our lectures are video recorded and podcast. You can access previous lectures on iTunes or through our Kennedy Center website. Uh, this lecture is also live broadcast on BYU Sirius XM channel 192 and available now on BYU's new IPTV system, which means if you have a, a wired computer, you can access all uh, Kennedy Center events uh, live streaming. You're here, though, so we're glad that you made it. Um, we uh, have a couple of upcoming lectures and events. We're starting into the tip of the busy season of September, and then it, then it just gets even crazier in October. Uh, but tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we will kick off our, our fall semester African Worlds uh, lecture series, lectures on Africa and the humanities. The first lecture in this series features Aminata Sofal, a renowned Senegalese author, and Professor Chantal Thompson from the Department of French. That will be in room 1102 of the JKB uh, all of the lectures throughout the semester will be held at 11 o'clock, most of them in this room, but tomorrow's uh, will be in 1102 JKB. Uh, we also encourage you to look at the schedule. There are four uh, African films that are part of International Cinema's fall semester schedule that will be screened in, par in partnership with uh, the African World's Lecture Series. Also tomorrow at 4 p.m. in the Library Auditorium, uh, the Political Science Department and the Wheatley Institution will be sponsoring a lecture by Robert Keohane of Princeton University. He will be speaking on political science as a vocation, and that is the keynote address for the Field Experiments and International Relations Conference, uh, also which Professor Hyde is, is attending. And so we're, uh, we're, we're very um, grateful to political science and to the Wheatley Institution for um, partnering and, and hosting these lectures. Uh, a week from tomorrow, next Thursday and Friday, the 27th and tw uh, 28th, uh, BYU Center for the Study of Europe will be hosting uh, their premier fall conference, Europe in a Nutshell. Uh, this conference features uh, day-long panels and a number of activities and events uh, that are on the handout that we've provided for you. Uh, but what's not on the handout that you might be interested in is that refreshments will be served between sessions, and CSE will be giving away a number of door prizes, including a $500 International Study Programs gift certificate and free airfare to Europe. Um, if that's not enough of an incentive, um, each session will include a prize, and every event attended will be another entry for the ISP and the airfare award. So if you attend all the sessions, your chances of winning airfare uh, or the ISP prize go up exponentially. Um, that, and you'll, you'll, you'll learn a lot, right? Um, you can follow uh, the conference for those sessions you can attend. Uh, we will be tweeting the conference and updates on Facebook. But uh, uh, Thursday, the 27th, all day sessions will be held in the Hinckley Center Assembly Hall starting at 11 a.m. with Professor Wade Jacoby's keynote on Europe in flux from the crisis of the 70s to the new millennium. Thursday evening, the 27th, in the Hinckley uh, Assembly Hall, the evening keynote, uh, John J. Hamra, who is the president and CEO of the Center for Strategic and International Studies from Washington, D.C. He'll be speaking on Europe and America, Are We Present at the Recreation of the Transatlantic Relationship? And then Friday sessions from 9 a.m. until uh, 1230 will be held in the Moot Courtroom 303 of the J. Reuben Clark Law School. So this is a, a, the first conference of its kind uh, that CSC is organized, and we'd encourage you uh, to attend as many sessions as possible and to take advantage of um, some very interesting presentations and discussions. We'd like to begin today's lecture with an opening prayer, as is our custom, and we've invited James Pacheo, who's a, an economics major from Oakton, Virginia, to do so, and then I will introduce our speaker. James. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for this day and the opportunity that we all have to be here today, gathered together, to be able to learn about uh, the politics of the country and the world. We're so very grateful uh, that we can be at this university to learn by study and by faith. We ask that thy spirit would be with us as we learn, that we will be able to understand, and that we'll be able to apply what we learn in our own lives 
uh, and that we will be able to better the world around us. We love thee, Father, and we ask these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Susan Hyde, Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at Yale University, is affiliated with the Macmillan Center and the Institute for Social and Policy Studies. She has held fellowships at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., and Princeton University's Nyhaus Center for Globalization and Governance. Her current research explores the effects of international democracy promotion efforts, and she's published in World Politics, Comparative Political Studies, Perspectives on Politics, and the Journal on po of Politics. She recently completed a book entitled Pseudo-Democrats' Dilemma, Why Election Monitoring Became an International Norm, the topic of her presentation today. Other research interests include international influences on domestic politics, elections in developing countries, international norm creation, election manipulation, and the use of natural and field experimental research methods. She has served as an international observer with several international organi or several organizations for elections in Albania, Indonesia, Nicaragua, Pakistan, and Venezuela, and has worked for the Democracy Program at the Carter Center. She teaches courses on international organizations, democracy promotion, the spread, the global spread of elections, and the role of non-state actors in world politics. She received her PhD from the University of California, San Diego. Please join me today in welcoming Professor Susan Hyde. All right. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. I also uh, wanted to say a special thank you to Darren Hawkins and Dan Nielsen, who I met uh, when I was an early PhD student, who were very nice to me, patient with me, <laughs> explaining all kinds of things. So I, um, I am grateful to actually see their, their home tour. Um, I have um, a number of things here. Let me just get this set up really quickly. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you some of my research on democracy promotion more generally, um, and election monitoring specifically. But it's all based on a desire to understand exactly how international actors, including powerful states, multinational corporations, NGOs, individual activists, and various other, other movements manage to influence politics and policies in other countries. So we think of the world as composed of sovereign states, uh, yet we have a number of things that, that basically are um, difficult to understand if we just think of, of the world as composed of um, individual states in, um, uh, in, in black boxes. Um, I make, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about, about the motivation for the project on election observation. So this is a little bit more general. Uh, I'm going to talk about the book a little bit and explain the general argument, and then I'm also going to speak, uh, assuming I have, have time, about a few other more general um, findings and implications of this project. All right, so one of the, the claims I'm going to make that's at the bottom of this slide, I'll show you in a moment, um, is that it's possible that given the state of the world today, autocrats, electoral autocrats, are, are more constrained than they have ever been before. So that's a, a little bit more of a, 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 it's a bold statement of, of the implications of my argument, but that is the conclusion that, um, that I think you can draw from some of the work that I've done. Uh, this is based on a variety of assumptions that I just want to go over quickly because they are related to my view of, of how these things work in the world. So one of the, the things that I'm, um, I'm assuming is that, in, in general, powerful international actors have preferences about the behavior of other international actors. Um, and they try to do what they can to encourage other international actors to behave in a way that uh, complies with those preferences. One of the preferences that has come um, to my attention uh, over the course of, of uh, my time as a graduate student and, and as a professor um, has to do with the value that these international actors place on democracy. Um, so I think that the, one of the, the assumptions, one of the trends, is that the value to international actors of democracy has fluctuated over time. Another thing that I assert or assume is that countries vary in their sensitivity to international pressure. Um, and, and this is something I could talk about for a long time, but I'm just going to gloss over. Countries vary in their sensitivity to international pressure. 
Um, another thing that's really important when thinking about democracy promotion, I, I am not saying, nor does anyone that I know say, that democracy promotion is the most important foreign policy goal of, of powerful states. Nobody thinks that democracy promotion is the most important foreign policy goal of, of powerful states. Rather, it is one of many foreign policy goals or many objectives that international actors have. Um, and it is sometimes comes in conflict with other more important objectives, such as um, economic investment in a particular region, access to particular markets, long-term stability, um, avoiding civil conflict. There's a number of other things that could be included on this list of preferences that I think international actors have. Democracy is one of them, <laughs> but it is, by, not at the top of the list, I'm pretty sure, uh, but it is still on the list, and that, that's part of what I'm talking about today. Okay, so I'm going to explain the statement at the bottom, which is that, uh, I, I already said, autocrats could be more constrained today than ever before. Um, and, and the question is how? Why would they ever buy into this system that results in them being more constrained? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but first, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a couple of examples of, of these trends that I'm talking about. I don't know where to point this so that it works more quickly. Okay, so a quick question. What do these countries have in common? China, Eritrea, Libya, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, and the United Arab Emirates. It's a little bit of a trick question. It's sort of rhetorical. Um, they are the only countries that between 2000 and 2010 did not hold a direct election for national office. So I'm excluding microstates with a population less than 500,000, but these are the only countries remaining in the world that did not ho hold a national level election between 2000 and 2010, um, and some of them have held an election since the end of, of my data, right? So we have um, had an election in Libya, and I think in, in Qatar, although that one was pretty, pretty borderline. I also hear that Somalia is working on organizing direct national elections. So this list could be shrinking even further relatively soon. Um, I also want to show you, the there's also an, another trend, another broad trend in the world today is that there are um, incre decreasing numbers of countries that are holding elections but not allowing some form of multi-party competition. So this list can change a little bit based on how you define competition, um, but it's, the, the point is, is that it's a short list. Right? There's not very many countries on this, um, and they're not countries we think of as, as sort of global leaders, um, with the exception of, well, yeah. <laughs> um, another thing that, that we see quite a bit, but there was another example of just yesterday, is pushback from electoral autocracy. So yesterday I read in the news that Russia has banned U.S. efforts at democracy assistance um, and is, is taking um, relatively um, abrupt measures to reduce their influence within their country. Um, many people look at that and say, oh, this is the end of, of democracy promotion. I look at that and see evidence that uh, there is something to this democracy promotion business, that if Russia cares so much about it, and this is one example of many examples of Russia trying to push back against Western influence that is in favor of democratic governance. And so you can see illustrations of this all the time. This is not universally good, <laughs> but I, I am trying to point out some of these puzzles. Um, another um, example is, is just um, that is a sort of illustration of the same trends that I was just showing. Uh, the total number of elections held in the world has been going up uh, um, and has been quite high since the end of the Cold War, um, as is the total number of elections that allow competition. And then the trend that I'm going to be talking about um, is uh, a another trend that follows with all of the ones I just talked about, which is that more countries n are inviting international election observers to their elections. Um, and this, I think, will play. I don't know if it's going to work. This is a demonstration. Oh, okay, so it's a little bit animated. That. Countries in white have no national elections. This is animated over time. Countries with the lightest shade have elections with no competition. Medium shade elections with competition, no international observers. And then the darkest shade are, are elections held um, with international election observers uh, invited to those elections. And so we see by the end of the time period, it's spread nearly universally. Um, I'll just let it go through one more time so you can watch the trend. I'm not very good at this type of mapping, so it's this a little bit amateur, but um, it does show, I think, that the trends over time, are, are, these things are just spreading very rapidly, especially since the end of, um, uh, since, since the end of the Cold War. I'll just do one more, okay. 
Um, we have even the developed democracies, even countries in Europe and the United States, um, Canada, Belgium, countries like this are now also inviting international election observers. So it has spread beyond the developing world to even countries um, that uh, we wouldn't expect would need to prove that they're, they're democratic in any way or that they're holding democratic elections. Uh, this is a figure that shows international election observation over time um, in, in this er early period, or um, I guess I'm supposed to stay by the microphone, in this early period, uh, in the early 1960s, in this area, area of time, this is something that some governments did. They invited international observers to judge their elections, but countries that did not invite observers were not really judged. It was sort of a, a somewhat strange thing to do, sort of commented on in the media, but otherwise not that interesting. By the end of this period, the, the part that I think is interesting is that most everyone is inviting international observers, up to 80% of all elections held in the world, and countries that fail to invite, invite observers um, basically get labeled as countries that are holding fraudulent elections. And there are numerous news reports in which those few countries that are not inviting international observers are, the, the, the news reports or the politicians citing those elections say the reason why they think that the elections were fraudulent was because the government failed to invite international observers. So this is an argument used by the US government, for example, when talking about the uh, 2009 Iranian elections. Okay. Another part of this puzzle is that governments are not just inviting international observers. They're inviting international observers, and a subset of them are cheating in front of them. So they're inviting international observers and getting caught manipulating their elections. So this is really the puzzle that I started this project with. Why do you have so many governments in the world inviting in these foreigners, committing fraud in front of them, and facing international costs as a result? This is something that I think um, takes a little bit of explanation, so that's what I'm going to focus on explaining to you. So the puzzle, just uh, again, is that many leaders invite observers and are, and are caught and condemned for election manipulation. Negative reports from election monitors are associated with a variety of costs, which I could go into. Uh, inviting observers is a choice made by each government. So this is an important point. Observers are not forced upon these, these countries. Um, there were few, especially in the early decades of election observation, uh, most international actors were very reluctant to engage in it and often refused invitations from specific countries to send election observers. Um, observers today will not go, the reputable observers will not go unless they have credentials. Um, and there's a very practical aspect to this. That you, it's very difficult to observe an election unless you have access from the government and the authority to be there, go into various election-related uh, centers during the course of elections. Um, all right, uh, another part of, so yeah, so negative reports from election monitors are associated with a variety of costs. Um, I just got a little behind myself here. I was pushing and it wasn't going. Um, and so the, the question is, why has election monitoring become an international norm? And before I get uh, too far, I just want to quickly do a couple of definitions for those of you not familiar with either of these phenomena, election observers or international norms. Um, Election observers, international election observers, the type I'm talking about, are official delegations of foreigners that are officially invited by the host government to observe and report on the quality of the elections. They do not intervene in the process, but they're allowed to report on the quality of the process. Um, an international norm, it's a political science term, I don't know how, how common, it, um, uh, how many people would have studied or come across this. Um, the, the definition in international relations literature is that an international norm is a, a shared standard of behavior appropriate for actors with a given identity. And what this means in the context of election observation is that it has become a shared expectation among a variety of, of international actors, primarily Western, um, that governments holding democratic elections will invite international election observers. So this is the, the norm that I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm going to just go through this. Okay, I, I'm going to get a little bit political science-y for a second and just say that the leading explanations for this type of phenomenon are a little bit different from what I'm talking about. So when people are trying to explain the formation of international norms, they frequently focus on transnational advocacy. So morally motivated groups of people intent on causing a specific type of change in the, in the international system. Um, and so these, the, the reason why a norm becomes a norm is because a group of norm entrepreneurs are successful at persuading other groups of people, other states, other important actors, um, that that 
behavioral expectations should change. There are a lot of examples of this happening in, in history, so I'm not trying to dispute it, I'm just providing an alternative. Um, another common explanation for the formation of international norms is that norms are created to facilitate or, or reinforce international cooperation. So basically that powerful states would like the system to work in a certain way. In order to make that system work as efficiently as possible, they force international norms to be established through their authority um, and everyone else complies with those norms. My argument is distinct from both of these in that I argue that states seeking international benefits, seeking international approval for their behavior and seeking the benefits that go along with this can generate unintended international norms, but that are, that are still consequential. So you could end up with a norm like the norm of election observation, not because anyone sought to create it, um, but because of the incentives faced by states seeking international, um, international benefits, seeking approval for their behavior. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about types of states because this is important to my argument. So there, there are several types of states that I, I, am, I am assuming, right? This is not a perfect typology, but I'll talk about them quickly. Some states in the world, in my model of, of why election observation became a national norm, international norm, are those that are seeking international benefits. Um, some states are allocating international benefits. So you could think about this very generally in terms of foreign aid. Some states are foreign aid donors. Some states are foreign aid recipients, right? You can make this division along a lot of different lines talking about a variety of other international benefits. Um, given a change in preferences amongst powerful states about the value of democracy, so now I'm narrowing down quite a bit, States that are seeking international benefits should be motivated to change their behavior. And the biggest change in the value of democracy at the international level in the period that I'm looking at happened with the end of the Cold War. Um, I also assume that there are basically two types of benefit-seeking states. Uh, those that are what I call true democrats, so countries that are actual leaders of countries, governments that are actually committed to democratic norms and democratic rules. Um, and pseudo-democrats, which are an interesting phenomenon, an interesting group of leaders in my mind, uh, who are willing to comply with the letter of democratic rules and, and norms, but are basically unwilling to leave power if they were actually to, to lose an election. So you have a bunch of governments in the world that I think are, are in, in essence trying to fake democracy in order to comply with these international expectations, but have no intention of actually being real democratic governments. Okay, so how do we get this international norm? In, in, in my model, true Democrats, um, because there are these benefits associated with looking and acting like a democracy, are motivated to distinguish themselves from pseudo-Democrats. They know they're out there, they don't wanna be lumped into the same group, um, and uh, they, they are w working to find a way to signal that they are in fact the real governments that are democratizing where in contrast to, to the rest. Because of this incentive that to, true Democrats had to find a signal of their type to international audience and therefore get the international benefits associated with looking and acting like a democracy, um, this led to uh, an overtime development that international actors beca began to believe that if you were a state who was not already clearly a democracy. And you were committed to becoming a democracy. You invited international election observers. And this is in part because of the state, the states that were the early adopters of international election observation were relatively democratic. Um, if this belief exists, if outside powerful states believe that all true Democrats invite international observers, then the pseudo-Democrats also have the incentive to invite international observers. They have the incentive to try to fake that signal as well. So not only are they holding multi-party elections in which they never intend to lose, they're also inviting international observers and hoping that those international observers don't catch their manipulation. Right, that's, that's the game that I'm describing here. Okay, so how did this become a norm exactly? The, 
the moment at which I think it became a norm is when international actors began to expect that all good types, all true Democrats, would invite international observers. Um, the signal that I'm talking about is, is inviting international observers and getting their endorsement of the quality of their elections, right? So if you invite observers and then they condemn your elections, you're not passing the test. Um, the content of the report is informative, and, and so pro-democracy actors are also agencies. They're trying to continually make the signal harder to fake. So you have international election observers continually trying to get better at distinguishing between true, true Democrats and, and pseudo-Democrats. You also have pseudo-Democrats continuing to try to fool international observers. So you have a lot of changes over time in this game, and I, I think it's, um, it's a little bit difficult to pin down, but I'm, I'm relatively certain that that's what's been going on. Okay, so again, just to review what I think is happening, in this early period of election observation, you just have a few states a year inviting international observers. These are true Democrats, uh, almost all of them. Um, seeking to prove, and, and this is documented in the language they use when they justify their decision to seek international election observers, seeking to prove to international audiences that they are in fact ready to hold democratic elections, that they're really committed to moving towards democracy and that they want to be separated from the other countries that are not like them. Um, in the period um, that lines up pretty closely with the end of the Cold War, right about 1990, 1991, um, you have a dramatic increase in international benefits tied to democracy. Um, a lot more of these true Democrats are recognizing that this is a signal, expectations change, and then all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of pseudo-Democrats also attempting to invite international observers and get their endorsement. This is not supposed to be a slide you can read, um, but it's to show that this is a phenomenon that has proliferated. There are, I'm missing a bunch too, that since I made this slide, there are more and more organizations sending international election observers. Not all of them are good. That's not what I'm trying to talk about here, but I, I'm trying to explain why we go through this charade of inviting international observers. And there are so many international organizations and NGOs that are willing to, um, that are willing to send international observers. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some of the empirical implications. Um, and so I'm gonna show you some evidence that I've collected over the last um, 10 years or so about things that correlate with international election observation. Um, according to the argument that I just laid out for you, it, it implies that the spread of election observation uh, shouldn't be completely random across the world. It should be correlated with specific types of states or states that have specific characteristics. Um, the first thing that should predict it is uh, this Cold War division. So I'm talking about the end of the Cold War. Um, I, I also think that states that are already clearly democracies are not going to be the first adopters of this. It's going to be states whose type, according to what I'm talking about, is, is uncertain. Um, as I've already mentioned, true Democrats should be more likely to observe elections early, followed by pseudo-Democrats later in the, in the diffusion of election observation. Um, there should be an increase in international benefits tied to democracy that correlates with uh, the, the increase in election observation. Um, and countries that are strategically important for other reasons to Western actors might be the ones most likely to avoid complying with this, more inter this new international norm. So the, the classic example of this until very recently is Egypt. Um, until their most recent elections, Egypt's, Egypt has never invited international observers, and it's one of the countries that's an exemption to, um, to this trend. The reason is they're, they're very strategically important to, to the US. Okay. Um, there's a few other things. Governments that uh, receive negative reports should receive fewer international benefits. So that needs to be true for my, my theory to hold together. Election observation must be more costly for cheaters, for pseudo-democrats, than for true democrats. After the norm development, de oops. After the norm develops, governments that do not invite observ observers should be perceived as pseudo-democrats or as, as electoral autocrats, more precisely. Um, I also think that, um, and this is something that I, I've mentioned already, that, that forms of manipulation, forms of election fraud, forms of, of winning election without um, allowing full democratic competition should change over time in, in what I call an evolving game of strategic manipulation between pseudo-democrats and international observers. And what this means over time is that you have, you have 
increases in the cost of the signal. So in 1990, it's actually not that hard if you're a pseudo-democrat to invite international observers and fool them. I think it's a lot harder today than it used to be. You have to be a little bit trickier <laughs> than, you, than you had to be in, in 1990 to, um, to actually fool the good international observers. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because I don't have, um, I wouldn't leave time for Q&A and whatnot, but I'm just going to show you that the trends of early inviters are consistent with the Cold War alliances. Countries that are aligned with the US are very quickly go into the pool of countries that always invite international observers. Early inviters are more democratic already than countries that are inviting late. Um, and I, I know I'm going through these quickly. Um, I talked about how elections that are held in countries of uncertain type should be more likely to be observed. I have a number of in indicators of uncertain type. How do you know that a country is not a democracy or what makes you suspicious that a country might not be holding democratic elections? I'm gonna show a bunch of those. Um, this is, uh, the top line is the rate of, of um, elections held in the world in which there are pre-election concerns about fraud. And you can see that most of those are observed by the end of the period that I'm studying. Um, same with the elections held by transitional governments. So these are frequently elections held after a civil war, after a military coup, after some other disruption in governance. Um, elections run by trans transitional governments are very likely to be observed under almost the entire time period that election observation exists. Um, Elections that follow a suspension of previous elections, which is similar to the last slide, um, but, but a, little bit, a little bit more specific, uh, also very likely to be observed um, after about 1990. So again, elections in which the type of, the, the behavior of political actors is uncertain are, are really getting targeted by international observers. Um, this is the rate of all um, elections that are a country's first multi-party election that are observed. So you can see by the end of the period, most countries have already had their first multi-party elections, um, but those are very likely to be observed as well. Um, let's skip this. I, <laughs> I think this is a little bit of an interesting uh, figure to stare at for a while. Um, this is the, the group of countries that between 2000 and 2006, um, which is the end of, 2006 is the end of the book project. Um, I, although I'm updating things now, um, these are the countries that did not invite observers to at least one election. And so some of them are idiosyncratic. Um, they didn't invite for some particular reason or they invited observers too late and they refused to go or, or something like that. Um, but you have countries that, uh, a lot of them that it refused to invite in the early 2000s are inviting by the end. So, um, you know, Madagascar, Mauritania, Singapore are all falling into this. Um, into this trend. And many of those countries, many of these very, very late adopters are inviting observers and being s sort of strongly criticized in that first election that's internationally observed. So these are countries that knew they were not going to pass the test but are still coming around to complying with this international norm um, in many cases anyway. Countries that don't are marked by, um, countries that don't allow multi-party competition are marked with squares. And so you can see Turkmenistan, um, North Korea, Laos, um, Vietnam, and Cuba are the countries that are never inviting observers um, and that in this period held an election that by the criteria I'm applying it for this particular slide are not allowing full multi-party competition. Okay. So I, a few more implications before I stop talking about, about the book project. Um, one of the things that I've done that I'm not presenting today has shown that international observers can reduce election fraud on election day. So this is through some um, subnational variation and some field experiments that show that international election observation can be quite costly to the incumbent on election day if that incumbent is engaging in election fraud. So one of the cases, it's about a 6% difference um, between observed and unobserved polling stations in the incumbent's vote share, which works out in that particular case with Armenia 2003 elections to be about 2.5% across the entire election, right? So you did 2.5% worse in, in the election because international observers were there, one could infer, uh, which also in that particular case might have sent the election into a second round. Okay, although the incumbent still won, I'll say. <laughs> they, they didn't uh, actually... Uh, have anything to do with that. Okay, 
Pseudo-Democrats want to invite observers and receive a positive report. Observers want to evaluate election quality accurately. This creates an evolving game of strategy that I, I've had the most trouble studying because it's very um, slippery over time. Um, but one of the things that I think is happening is that direct forms of election manipulation have become less likely over time. Election day fraud, election day fraud has become less likely over time. Stealing the vote tally sheets and changing them has become less likely over time. Um, indirect forms of manipulation have become more likely. Not all indirect forms of manipulation are better. Um, we can think of two forms of indirect manipulation, gerrymandering, right, drawing electoral districts so that they benefit one candidate. Government can take care of that. You can also think of uh, mysterious disappearance of the leading opposition candidate as a form of indirect manipulation. So I think gerrymandering, probably better than direct election fraud. Mysterious disappearance of opposition candidate, worse than direct election fraud. So it's, you have to really balance out which one of these, you know, is this a good trend or a bad trend? I don't know. Um, but it, it is that concealing election manipulation, concealing strategies of election manipulation has become something that governments are clearly trying to do. Um, one of the things that observers have done is that in the, especially in the 80s um, and, and before, they were very likely to just monitor election day. Um, that has not been true since like 1993, uh, yet people still say it. Um, it's been a long time that that has not been true, and I don't know why people keep saying elect election monitors need to realize that elections are more than election day. I think it's pretty clear that they realize that, um, um, although election day is a nice day to get press. Um, and and they, they recognize that as well. Um, the end result is that I think we have pseudo-Democrats who are more constrained, um, probably. We might also have this other thing. I don't know exactly what to call it, but um, someone told me that certain types of bacteria or diseases that are exposed to too much antibiotics can become antibiotic resistant. So we might be producing a strain of autocrats that is sort of immune to any form of international pressure, right? So we might be, have, have some, some of these leaders that are actually just getting really good at playing this game. And they're gonna be even harder to um, influence for the actors that are attempting to influence them in the future. So I, I think we, I think most of them are more constrained. I think stealing elections is harder than we generally think of it, but um, that's, the, that's the end. So um, let's see. I'll just summarize quickly. Um, so one of the things I've argued is that election observation has become an international norm even though nobody tried to make it an international norm. I think it's an unintended international norm. There was no one advocating this. Um, election monitoring became an international norm in part because it is costly for pseudo-democrats and in part because it is imperfect. If international observers perfectly detected election manipulation, in every single election, pseudo-democrats never would have invited them, right? So in part, the reason that this institution has become so widespread and, and in my view, so potentially influential is, is because it's not perfect, is because they, they make errors. They sometimes legitimize leaders who have stolen elections. Um, and I think that that's a, a necessary cost in, in this dynamic. Um, this, though, I think, uh, C contributes to the, the, the notion that almost all governments are holding elections today, that almost all governments are inviting international observers. The governments that hold elections are also um, complying with a number of other very small trends like transparent ballot boxes and protocols for ensuring the integrity uh, of, of ballots and um, indelible ink, which I, I actually don't think works very well, and standards for maintaining the integrity of voter registration lists. And there's all of these other little trends that are, that are spreading widely throughout the world. You can see the same type of standards for transparency in countries you would never guess would be <laughs> cooperating to, to produce um, the, the same standards for transparency in their elections. So I think we have um, seen uh, this become a lot more difficult or at least require a lot more strategy for governments to steal elections and remain in power. Um, but it's not, it's not perfect, and there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that are, I would call, sort of unintended or, or negative implications of the, the norm of, of international election observation. So with that, I think it's good time for me to leave time for questions. We'll be stopping now. I did, um, 
I did put up some, I'm going to go through this and leave it. I did, I did bring some pictures from my election monitoring mission um, that I thought three weeks of walking in ballot boxes in Papua. Uh, it's a long time to walk in those ballot boxes. Uh, you know, military in Venezuela. Um, you can't see it very well, but it's a, in, because it's a national holiday, a lot of polling stations are in roads in Indonesia. Um, 400 observers in Albania. These ballot boxes you can find in almost any country in the world today. These happen to be in Albania, but I've seen them in Liberia, Afghanistan, and I think Cambodia. Um, election observation mission in Afghanistan. Um, uh, Pakistan, my security team in Pakistan. Um, this is uh, international press making the polling station official recount the votes in front of them so that they can broadcast it on the BBC. Um, part of our team in Afghanistan. Um, campaign posters in Afghanistan, which I was intrigued by. I didn't think that their female candidates for parliament would be wearing so much makeup, quite frankly. But <laughs> she is very, very pretty. And it's, you can't see, but uh, trying to avoid standing very close to a rocket-propelled grenade that they wanted me to hold in the photo. So. <laughs> Security team. It's hard, too hard to see, but again, the, yeah, so the same ballot box as Liberia. <laughs> uh, and I, yeah, more. Liberia is my most recent, uh, most recent mission, although the pictures aren't showing up so well. Yeah, that's, that's the end. Thank you. So we have a mic, if uh, you just raise your hand. And uh, please, uh, again, for the recording and our audience abroad, um, State your name and uh, what you're studying. My name is Abe Collier. I'm currently in the business management program. Mm -hmm. And at the start of your presentation, you talked a little bit about the spread of democracy and the promotion of democracy. But you uh, didn't make a value judgment on whether that was a good or bad thing. What, what are your thoughts about that? What has been the, the effect of that in the world? And is it something that should become more of a priority? Uh, way to put me spot on the spot right away. Um, I, I, mean, I try to avoid this question as a researcher, to be quite frank, because um, people get all tied up in whether democracy is a good or a bad thing. And I think uh, if of all of the things I've read, most people who are arguing against democracy are elite, political elite, who benefit from keeping the country not democratic. And most of the people who are arguing in favor of democracy are um, regular citizens who would prefer to not live under um, a, a non-democratic government. There are, of course, exceptions to that. Democracy has come, become very corrupt in a lot of places. Um, one of my uh, now retired colleagues is Robert Dahl, who I've been very excited to meet, and he talks about the value of democracy in ways that I find very persuasive. Um, and I don't know that I have more to add than what he says, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that uh, one of the things in actually answering your question is, is having a better understanding of the consequences of attempting to promote democracy. So I, in part, I think that we don't know the answer to your question yet. And if we're to promote democracy, then we're better off answering your question if we're able to understand the consequences of actually having those intentions, be they be they good or bad. I, mean, I think if you really push me, I would say I think it, overall, it's, it's, on average, it's a good thing for most countries. I think that the people of most countries prefer democracy over, 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 over autocracy. But then you have, I've spent a lot of time in Cambodia lately, and uh, they have multi-party elections. <laughs> but I think life is still pretty bad for most people most of the time. My name is Jesse Hawks. I'm an English major. Um, and I was wondering like, what, if there were any social implications in the qualifications for being like, a true democracy. You know, like if these, um, these multinational actors would look at you know, whether, whether women voting or if you have to be a landowner. Like, is there any implication of, um, of those social issues in qualifi qualifying? I, I think, yes, yeah, so this is a big debate. Is, is what does a country have to do to become considered a, a democracy? Um, one of the trends that has diffused and that other people have studied, and I'm just citing their, their studies, uh, along with this trend is um, the representation of women in parliament. 
um, that's another thing that you can say it, it's good if you believe in, in um, descriptive representation. Um, but the countries that are adopting high level quotas for women in parliament are the countries that have the worst records vis-a-vis -vis women in social issues, right? So Afghanistan has an extraordinarily high number of women who are guaranteed seats in parliament. Um, the election observers, when I, I use the argument true democracy as a, as a heuristic in trying to explain election observation, I'm not trying to define democracy thoroughly there. It's just uh, the distinction I'm making there is between governments that would allow themselves, leaders who would allow themselves to lose in, in an election and those who would not those who would accept defeat and those who would not. Um, obviously, there are many, many, many other components of democracy that are, that are also important. Um, I'm not trying to say that that's not the case, but um, when talking about election observation and the overemphasis on elections, elections are widely agreed upon to be a necessary condition for democracy to exist. Um, and some people argue that they help facilitate some of these, these other things. Um, you can certainly find people who argue that um, adopting elections too early, for example, following civil conflict, has a negative effect on the development of a variety of other things that might be helpful to a uh, full um, ideal type of, of democracy that, that we might read about in some of the comparative politics literature. So. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hannah Wheelwright. I'm studying political science. Um, in your argument, you had stated that um, part of the interesting thing about this is that there's nobody that's enforcing, there's nobody imposing um, election observers, that it's something that's developed. Um, is it a possibility that it might come a time when a nation, even a nation of true Democrats, would say, you know what, it's too much of a hassle to have election observers come in, we don't want to deal with them, mm -hmm. we're not going to allow them in, but um, say it's a country that has historically always had free and fair elections. Is that a possibility? And if it did happen, how would the international community react? Right. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, in a lot of ways, I mean, election obs observation does not cause democracy, right? It's a signal that a country is trying to show that it is committed to democracy. So it's, it, it's, not, the cr it do, it's not equivalent to democracy in any sense. It's just, it's a signal. Um, and so certainly countries are arguing that, but the, the funny game right now is that the countries that are making that exact argument that you said are countries like Russia, right? So you hear Russia saying, oh, we don't need these foreigners imposing their will. Countries that, um, you know, Belgium is like, well, you can come if you want. I, we don't really care. Um, you, you know, it, it's, it's going to be fine. And so you see this interesting use of that argument by countries that I don't think are democratic, and I don't think many political scientists scientists think are, are democratic today, um, in part because um, provides somewhat credible evidence that they are still stealing their election. Um, in terms of the, the norm of election observation going forward, I think that they're, the, the biggest thing that I think will change it is the, the thing that I started talking about at the beginning, which is the value that international actors place on democracy. I think if we enter, enter another bipolar era in which an autocracy isn't the other pole, election observation will be one of the first casualties, right? This is something that is, in, in, in many cases, completely dependent upon um, there being this reward for um, countries to look and act like a democracy that's relatively universal. And you're already seeing a little bit of that, right? You're already seeing countries more likely to push back if they have a lot of support from China, for example. Um, you also have um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization sending international election observers the Commonwealth of Independent States sending election observers. These are organizations that are not pro-democracy, but they're still sending international election observers. So, you know, the answer to your question is, the short answer is, of course I can imagine that, um, but we're not in a, at a point where we're seeing that yet. My name is Jake, I'm studying civil engineering, and uh, my question was, I, you touched on this a little bit, but could you give uh, some other examples of, of pseudo-democracies in the world, and also, when these election observers go into these countries, what kind of things are they looking for to tell if it is a pseudo-democracy? Um, thank you, that's a, that's a good question. I, so examples of other pseudo-democracies, I think um, countries that are labeled more generally in comparative politics as electoral autocracies often fall into this category. I think Venezuela is definitely at the top of my list. <laughs> a, a, a you know, they've, they've fallen more into the everyone thinks they're just cheating category, but um, for at least five or, five or six years, they were really doing a good job at, at playing the game. Um, Zimbabwe, relatively good, 
um, for a while, but has, again, been exposed relatively recently. So um, Russia, certainly, um, some of the Russian-aligned countries, Belarus is, you know, I'm giving some of the more obvious example of countries where we know they're, they're cheating. Um, the countries that manage to invite international observers, commit election fraud, and get away with it are, are a little bit harder. I actually think Nicaragua falls into that category right now. Um, under the, the, the rule of Daniel Ortega, I think uh, I've studied the election results pretty carefully, and there, there's funny business going on, but it's really hard to say exactly where it's coming from and, 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 and what's going on. So I think um, the, the, the list is, is long. I don't, I don't know if I, if I should keep going. Um, and your second question was pseudo-democracy. What do they look for? What do election observers look for? So they are not trying to label countries true democracies or pseudo-democracies. That's my language. <laughs> um, what they are saying is that this, so when, it, when an international organization has clear standards and that international organization is monitoring the election, they say this country has failed to meet its international obligations under our international organization's agreement. So the OSCE, oh dear, will say this country has failed to meet OSCE standards for democratic elections. Um, a lot of, almost all countries in the world, you can now go to databases and look up which obligations countries have made. Almost all countries in the world have committed themselves to abiding by democratic rules. So a lot of what international observers do is say, you have violated your own laws and your own international agreements in all of these ways. Um, and they look for any type of overt bias in um, the administration of the elections, uh, media time allotted to candidates, uh, violence against opposition groups, the ability to, for, for, for all political parties to organize and, and speak to voters. Um, voter education is sometimes an issue. Um, the distribution of voting materials is sometimes an issue where they're not distributed to opposition strongholds and they are distributed to government strongholds. Um, the, the list is actually quite long of, of what they look for and there are, there are books about this, but the countries that, that violate these rules um, and that get caught for it are, are not very subtle. Typically, I know everybody has to go to class. So. Yeah. Thank you, very much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah, it goes, 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 go